to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 1 John 4 verse 8. Welcome to our study of the book of 1 John. In this second lesson on 1 John, we're going to notice how that in chapters 3 through 5, John shows us that God is love, and the application is, we must walk in love. John begins by showing the great love that God has for us. In 1 John 3 verse 1, the Bible says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we can be called children of God, and this we are. John begins by putting the love of God at the forefront and says, Look at God's amazing love for mankind. Behold, what manner of love He has showered upon us, that what? That we can be called children of God. Friend, it is by the love of God that we have the privilege of calling God our Father. And that love came at a very high cost. Romans 5 verses 6 through 8, the Bible says, For God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Scarcely for a righteous man one might die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might dare to die. But listen to this. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friend, when we think about the amazing love of God, it's beyond comprehension that while man was at his worst, when man was a sinner and ugly and pitiful and stabbed God in the back multiple times, that's the point when God sent His Son, His beloved Son, to die for us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God took His own Son and made Him a sin offering for our sin, and yet Jesus had no sin of His own. 2 Corinthians 8 9 puts it in the beautiful scheme of, or the beautiful picture of Christ and all that He gave up. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty, might be made rich. Think of what Jesus gave up in the realms of heaven, left that, came to earth, lived and died as a man. And why? So that we could have the hope of salvation. Look at John 3, 16. God so loved the world that He gave. Gave what? His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Galatians 4, 4 says it this way. While we were at our worst, when man had come to a point where sin was unbearable to God, when it was uh, God had sent His Son to die in the world for us, Galatians chapter 4 shows that in due time Christ did die for mankind, died for the ungodly, and therefore we can be called children of God. We are adopted sons and daughters of the God of heaven. And so look at God's amazing love. Now, what does this love cause us to do? Friend, when we see the love of God, walking in God's love means, and it causes us to purify ourselves. 1 John 3, verse 3, John says, Everyone who has this hope, the hope that knowing we are children of God and that we'll be changed to the image of Jesus, verse 2, everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself. The love of God is what causes us to want to live a pure life. God said, Be holy. He who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, that it is the goodness of God that brings man to repentance. Hebrews 12, verse 14 teaches us that without holiness, no one will see God. And when I look at the life of Christ, all that He did, the way He lived, how that He lived a perfect life, He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4 verse 15, when I look at the great love that God had for me, friend, it humbles me. 
It makes me want to live a holy life. I want to live for God every day. I want to be faithful to the cause of Christ and I want to glorify God because of His great love for me and for you. But you know, walking in love also, it not only causes us to live pure lives, but walking in love ought to cause us to avoid sin. John identifies what sin is. Notice 1 John 3 verse 4. John clearly says what sin is. He says in verse 4, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And notice, sin is lawlessness or transgression of the law. When I want to live in view of the love of God, a pure life, I need to clearly understand what sin is. We need to avoid lawlessness, lawlessness for all Transgression of the law is sin. 1 John 5, 16 says all unrighteousness is sin. And so we have all lawlessness. When God sets up a standard, His Word is our law, James 1, 22 through 25, and we break that law. We do other than what the Word of God says, we've sinned. When we do unrighteousness, when we do things that we know are ungodly, 1 John 5, 16 says that's a sin. And James identifies another sin. James 4 verse 17, For him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is a sin. And so walking in love means that I want to know what sin is and I want to avoid it. Now friend, let's be honest. And let's be clear. There are people who come to the book of 1 John and try to teach that a Christian can't sin and they misuse verses like 1 John 3 verse 9. Notice what 1 John 3 verse 9 says. Look at this passage. John says concerning sin, whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Is John trying to teach that a child of God can never sin? Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Some will say he cannot sin and therefore they believe past just like these teach that a child of God cannot so sin as to be lost. Friend, if that's true, John has already contradicted himself twice. 1 John 1 verse 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin. If we say that we have no sin, we make Him a liar, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us all iniquities. Who's John writing to? Christians. And he says, you've got to walk in the light, and what that means is you need to recognize you do sin, and you need to confess that. Now wait a minute. Why would we need to do that if we cannot sin? What about 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2? John says, These things I write to you, my little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. John says, I'm writing so that you may not sin, but if you do, wait a minute, I, didn't, I thought Christians could not sin. You see, it all is based on the language of 1 John 3, verse 9. That word sin in 1 John 3, verse 9 is in the present tense. What that means is, this is not a, a one-time sin. John is not saying whoever is born of God can never commit one sin. John is saying whoever is born of God does not continue in a life of sin. In fact, most translations today recognize that as present tense, durative, continuing action. All John is saying is, if you're born of God and His seed remains in you, you're not going to continue practicing a life of sin. You cannot do that and be a faithful child of God. Now friend, be sure. The Scriptures teach that a child of God can sin and be lost. Over and over again this is taught. The Bible says, and I want you to think about Galatians 5 verse 4. The Bible says in Galatians 5 verse 4, You who attempt to be justified by law, you have become severed from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Who's John? Who's Paul writing to? Galatians 1, 1 and 2, he's writing to the churches of Galatia. People in the church are saved and are a, body of, a part of the body of Christ. And so two Christians... Paul says, those of you who are in the body, who are trying to go back and be a, attempt to be justified by law, you've become cut off from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Now so many today say you can't fall from grace. You can't sow sin as to be lost. Paul said the exact opposite. Think about Acts chapter 8 verses 20 through 22. Here's Simon. 
Simon in his past life has been something like a magician, a trickster. He now sees that through the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit is given and real miracles are present. He reverts back after his conversion and says, I'll give you money if you give me that gift. And Peter says to him, your money perish, listen to this, with you. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your heart's not right with God. Repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. He was in sin, needed to be forgiven, and notice his money was going to what? Perish with him. Here's Simon. Just obeyed the gospel. He sinned after obeying the gospel, and he was told, you're going to be lost, you're going to perish. People who are Christians can sin. They shouldn't. They ought not to live in sin, but sometimes they do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, Take heed lest ye fall. Revelation 3 verses 4 and 5, Some in the church in Revelation were going to have their names taken out of the book of life if they were not careful. And so is 1 John 3 9 teaching it's impossible to sin? No. All it's teaching is if the Word of God remains in you, Luke 8, 11, it's the seed. If we're trying to follow the teaching of Jesus, you can't practice sin and still claim to be faithful to God. This is what John has been teaching throughout. Now, 1 John 3, verse 18 shows us that walking in love is not something you say, it's something you do. What does it mean to walk in love? Look in 1 John 3, verse 18. Remember, God is love and we must walk in love, but what does that really mean? Notice 1 John 3, verse 18. John says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The idea of deed is in action and in truth. We can't just say, God, I love you, and then never do anything. To walk in love, like walking in light, means that we must do what God says. Think about James chapter 2. James gives us an illustration of real faith, what it means to walk according to the teaching of Jesus. And James says, imagine you've got in, your, uh, in this scenario someone who comes in and they're naked and they're destitute, they need food and the clothing, and they come to you and they tell you about this and you say, God bless you, I hope you get what you need, and you send them off. And you never give them anything. Have you shown your faith? He says, no, you can't show your faith without doing something. You can't show your love for God without doing something. Just like that person who came in and was needy and you said, oh, we love you so much. God bless you. We hope you get what you need. And you just kind of push them out the door and never give them anything. Have you really shown them love? Of course not. You've got to do something to show your faith and you've got to do something to show your love. Jesus said this. This is nothing new. John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. That leads right into 1 John 3 verse 24. To walk in love, to walk in love that's in deed and in truth, you must obey the commandments of God. Notice 1 John 3 verse 24. The Bible says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given us. How can we know? John's writing a lot about knowing. How can you know you're walking in love and that you abide in God? It's very simple. If you take the Bible with an unbiased, unprejudiced attitude, and you read what it says, and you do it. Friend, the way to know a true and tried bulletproof way of knowing you're in the love of God is to take the Bible and do what it says. You can't know beyond that. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 teaches us obedience is essential to showing my love to God. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. Matthew 7 21, you've got to do the will of God. Hebrews 7 verse 25 and 26, Jesus will save the uttermost those who come to God through Him. You've got to do His will. And Jesus asked a haunting question in Luke 6, 46, Why are you calling me your Lord and not doing what I say? And so when we talk about walking in love that's in deed and truth, that means I've got to do what the Bible says. You know, to walk in love, you've got to do what the Bible says. And part of that means you've got to test the spirits to see if they're really of God. Look in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. And walking in love means not believing everything you hear, but testing it. 1 John 4, verse 1, John says, Beloved, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Well, what are these spirits? Here it is. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. When I'm walking in love, that doesn't mean that I don't ever confront anybody, that I don't take what somebody says and check it by the Bible. Friends, walking in the love of God means that I've got to test what I hear and make sure that it's right. As John said, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Friend, I want you to listen real carefully. Just because someone is a likable person, just because someone may be dynamic and have a good spirit and attitude about them, does not mean they're a servant of God. What this passage is clearly teaching all of us is, don't believe everything you hear. Have the attitude of the Bereans. Here's the best way of doing what John said in 1 John 4, 1. Acts 17, 11, Paul comes to uh, the church in the area of Berea, and the Bible says these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. That's all John is suggesting, what Jesus taught throughout and what Paul taught. When you hear the word, hear it readily, hear it gladly, and then check it by the Bible. If it's true to the word of God, believe it because God said it, not because men said it, but don't be so gullible that you believe everything. This is why multitudes of people are going to be lost. Multitudes of people are told, for example, to be saved. All you've got to do is call on the name of Jesus. And that's all. Just come forward and say the sinner's prayer and bow at the altar and you'll be all right with God. And they never check their Bible to see if that's right. Friend, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. We're never told to do that for salvation. We're never told that belief alone will save. In fact, the opposite's true. James 2.24 says faith alone will never save anybody. All we're trying to encourage you, all John is trying to encourage us to do is don't believe what you hear. Check it by the Bible and make sure it's right. But you know, walking in love also means not only that I test the spirits, but that I realize the power is in God and His Word. Look at 1 John 4 verse 4. Here's a, a powerful passage about where we look for power today. John says in 1 John 4 verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, notice, because He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Where, who, who's in the world? John chapter 8, the devil is the prince of the power of the air of this world. He's the one who's ruling evil people, and thus he who is in us, God, is where the power is. God's already defeated the devil. Hebrews 2 verse 14, He's more powerful than him. Revelation 20, 19 and 20, He cast him into the bottomless pit. God has always had power over the devil and thus walking in love means I realize my power is not in me. It's in God who is the greatest of all. Philippians 4 verse 13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 says, Let your life be without covetousness, for he who has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that you can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What shall man do to me? And thus we must trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Proverbs 3 and verse 5. Now, like the message of 1 John 1 and 2, walking in light means that we have to love our brethren, so it's true with the message of walking in love. In 1 John chapter 4, in the section about verses 9 following, John's going to now discuss how that walking in the love of God means that we also have to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice the words of 1 John chapter 4, and look at what John says in verse 21. Walking in love means that I love my brethren. The Bible says, This is the commandment we have from Him. He who loves God must love his brother also. You cannot walk in love and say, I love God, but I wish that fellow over there didn't come to church here. Or I love God, but you know, I just really, I really despise that individual who's part of this congregation. Walking in love means you've got to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews 13, 1 again says, Let brotherly love continue. The second commandment is, Love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, verse 30 following. And Jesus taught His disciples a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Well, how much did Jesus love them? How did in context to John 13 did He show His love? Jesus knelt down and washed the disciples' feet and humbled himself. The Creator, 
bowing down and washing the dirty feet of the disciples. That's the example from which John 13 verses 34 and 35 comes. And so to love God, we also have to love one another. Now, God's commandments, though, ought not to be a burden to us. It's true that there are some things in Scripture that challenge us. There are things in Scripture that are more difficult for each one of us to do probably. But the commands of God, commands like walking in light and walking in love, we ought not to view this as a burden. Look at what John says in 1 John 5 verse 3. The Bible says, This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Rather than being a burden, we ought to view the commands of God as a joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4 verse 4. And here's why we ought to view them as a joy. If I'm willing to take the Bible and do what it says, then friend, you can have the best life you can ever imagine. God's commands are not a burden. Oh, we've got to get up and go do this today. Or, oh, I've got to watch my tongue today. It's such a burden. No, no, not to be a burden. Because the commands of God give you the best life possible. Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Why is it a joy to keep the commands of God? Because I know in keeping those, I've got the abundant life. I've got the best life anybody anywhere could ever live. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, I know that God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of Him who called me. I know that I can be a godly person, a godlike person by keeping the commands of God. And I know that in keeping the commands of God, all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. The best life, all things to be a godly person, all spiritual blessings, why would anybody view the commands of God as a burden when actually the commands of God relieve our burden. The Bible says in Psalm 38, 4, my sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. Well, how do I get rid of that burden? By obedience to the gospel. If obedience to the gospel relieves my greatest burden, the burden of sin, then surely I ought not to realize, I ought not to think of God's commands as a burden, but rather a joy. And when we have that mindset, it's going to be our faith that gives us the victory. Notice 1 John 5 verse 4. Leading right into that, John says in verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Faith in the commands of God, faith in walking in the light and walking in love is what helps us defeat, have victory over the world. The world and all that's in it, John said, is going to pass away. 1 John 2 verses 15 through 17. Worldly people, ungodly people are going to burn in the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 8, Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15. Thus, to overcome that, we have to have our faith. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith is not just a, a leap out there into the dark. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is essential, my friend. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, the Hebrew writer said, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to Him must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So I've got to have faith to please God. It's essential. How do I get that faith? By studying, by reading the Word of God and in doing that, in, in studying the character of God and noting His promises and noting that God never lies and His promises are always sure when I, when I put my stock in that, in the Word of God and faith in God, that's where the victory is. Now here's the question Jesus asked. Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith? When the Lord comes back, will He find us faithful? Will our faith be the victory? May we have the boldness to do that. You know, my friends, eternal life can only be found by putting our trust in Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12, John says, Life is found, eternal life is found in Jesus. He is the only way men and women can be saved. Acts 4 verse 12, the apostle Peter said, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If men and women are going to be saved, it has to be by faith in Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Hebrews 7 verse 25, Jesus will save to the uttermost, completely is the idea, those who come to God through Him. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Thank God that this man, 
Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And so Jesus Christ makes eternal life possible. And friend, here's the good news of the book of John. What's John trying to get across to us? Yes, we've got to walk in light, and yes, we've got to walk in love. When we combine these two ideas, and you do that, you can know you've got eternal life. Look at what John says in 1 John 5, verse 13. This is one of those thematic statements in the book of John. 1 John 5, notice verse 13. John says, I've talked to you about walking in light, and I've talked to you about walking in love. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in His name. The good news is if we realize God is the light and we walk in the light and we obey His commands, we love one another, we love God, if we walk in love, realize that God is love, look at what He's done for us, allow that to cause us to live pure lives and to love one another and keep His commandments. If we do those things, John says you can know you've got eternal life. Friend, Christianity is not the best guess. Christianity is not a possibility. You live the Christian life according to the Bible. I mean without prejudice and out bias. And you do what Scripture says, you can know you're going to go to heaven. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Ephesians 5, 17 says, do not be ignorant, but understand the will of the Lord. If we study to show ourselves approved, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, if we do the commands of God, Philippians 4, verse 9, then I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm right with God and that I'm heaven bound. Friend, we ask you today, are you walking in light? Have you submitted your will to the light of the world, Jesus Christ? John 8 verse 12, have you obeyed His commands? Are you walking in love? Have you realized the great love that God has for you? And has that love motivated you to obey God's commands, to love other people, and to live a pure life? And is your faith going to be your victory. Friend, we desperately need to be obedient to the gospel so that we can be saved. You can know you're right with God. Do you know that today? If not, why not obey the gospel? Believe that Jesus is God's Son. Repent of those things that you know are not right in your life. Confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. In Acts chapter 2, when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. Are you walking in light and are you walking in love? If as a child of God, maybe your life has not been lived as it should, another opportunity has been afforded you to make it right. Friend, may God help each one of us. May we have the conviction of faith and heart to walk in love and walk in light so that one day we can hear these words enter in, good and faithful servant. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. And to God be the glory, this is the gospel of Christ.